Hi guys, my name is Tato, and we are here on Lena Extra for a revision session on assets and bases. Now, I want us to quickly take a look of what is it that we need to learn for us to make this session uh, achievable. Now, let's quickly look at our checklist. Now, on our checklist, it says make sure you can define an assets and base according to R. Okay, let me quickly. According to Arrhenius and Laurie Bronsted, can distinguish between strong and weak assets or bases with examples. Make sure you can distinguish between concentrated and dilute assets and bases. Make sure again that you can identify, and this is very important for our session, you can identify conjugate acid-base pairs for given compounds. Make sure again that you can write neutralization reactions of carbon laboratory acids and bases. And later on in the session, we will uh, perform some calculations based on titration reactions and motivating the choice of the indicator. And then we will look at ways to determine the approximate pH of salt in hydrolysis and then can explain pH scale and calculate pH values of strong acids and bases. Can define the concept of KW and explain auto-ionization of water. And this is quite interesting as well that we will be comparing KA and KB values of strong and weak acids and bases. And lastly, we will be comparing strong and weak acids, looking at pH, conductivity, and reaction, and reaction rate. Now, guys, I know that you've dealt with this topic in your respective schools, and I've watched as well some uh, videos on the LEN Extra revision, revision session where John and Tracy were conducting these sessions. Now, today's purpose uh, is simply to, to emphasize or to clarify on those specific as aspects which I feel you still need to be clear of. So if you're not getting the desired level uh, you're in your June examination, we are doing this session today so that we clarify all the issues that are important and all the misconceptions that have emanated when you were writing your exams. So I have designed some uh, nice questions for you so that we can go through them together so that you can be better able to master this topic. Now, let's go to exam question, question one. And this was adapted from the DBE senior certificate uh, high grade question paper in 2013. Now, the question reads, ammonia is very soluble. It's very soluble in water. This gas is bubbled through 500 centimeter cubed of water to form a solution of ammonium hydroxide. The equation below represents the chemical reaction taking place. Now, you have NH3 gas, which is ammonia, reacting with water in a liquid, giving us an equilibrium where we have NH4+, plus, which is the ammonium ion in aqueous, plus the hydroxide ion also in aqueous. <laughs> now, the first question reads, how will you classify ammonia in terms of brownstein lowry theory? Now, just to recap a little bit, guys, you will remember that in theory, we learned about the Arrhenius uh, principle of naming acids and bases and as well as the Bronsted and Lowry theory. Now Arrhenius was specifically saying that whenever an acid reacts with water then it will produce an H plus ion. So any species or any substance that is able to react with water and produce an H plus ion will be called an Arrhenius acid. Wherein 
And Arrhenius base will be that particular substance that when it reacts with water, it will be able to produce the OH minus or the hydroxide ion. And then if the particular substance produces the OH or the hydroxide ion, then we can call the particular substance an Arrhenius base. Now, that is just a recap. Now, on the Bronsted and Lowry theory, you will remember that their emphasis is not specifically on the substances that react with water, but it is they specify uh, an acid as that particular substance that is able to donate a proton. And they define then a base as a, a substance that, it, that is able to accept a proton. Now, going back to the question, how would you classify ammonia in terms of bronsted lowry theory? Now, I've just explained to you that the bronsted lowry theory states that an acid is a proton donor and a base is a proton acceptor. Now, when we look into our reaction, we have ammonia reacting with water. Now, if you take a look at ammonia here, we started with NH3 and ended up with NH4. Now, you can clearly see that us moving from NH3 to NH4, we've gained a proton. So, if we have gained a proton, according to bronsted lowry theory, this means that NH3 should be a base because we defined a base, according to Bronsted, as a substance that gains a proton and an acid as a substance that donates an, an, a proton. So our answer will therefore be NH3 is a base. Explain your answer. It is a proton acceptor. Did you get that, guys? Yes? So we are saying here, when we look at our reaction, we started with NH3, which then gained a proton to become NH4+, plus, which is the ammonium ion. And that, uh, that being the case, then we conclude that NH3 is a base. I hope you understood that. Now, 1.2. Identify the acid and its conjugate base for the reverse reaction. Now, before we answer this question, guys, I just want you to remember something. Remember that, say you are given an acid halide, say HX, where X can be either a halide, a Cl, an F, a, a Br. Now, when this acid dissolves in water or reacts with water, it will produce H plus plus X minus. Now, when you look at this reaction, HX should have given away a proton. So if it gives away its proton, it means that HX is a Bronsted and Lowry acid. Because we said a Bronsted and Lowry acid, it is an acid that donates a proton. So HX in this reaction has donated a proton. And this leaves us with X minus. Now, when you look on the product side, you have X minus, which then becomes a base if we look for the reverse reaction. If we look for the reverse reaction, X will react with H plus to produce back HX. Now, you have HX, which is an acid, and you have X minus, which is able to accept a proton, which then acts as a base. Now, these two, HX being an acid and X being a base, form what we call an acid-base pair. But 
What is the difference between the HX and the X minus? One can clearly see that this molecule, which is HX, has a hydrogen and X minus does not have a hydrogen. Guys, this is what we mean by a conjugate a conjugate acid-base pair. Now, you have an acid, you have a base, but when you look at the difference between this acid and the base, there is one proton either missing or added. So if you have two pairs, one being an acid, one being a base, and there's a proton extra on either one of them, then you can call the acid that acid-base pair a conjugate acid-base pair. Now, let's get to the question then. They are asking us to identify the acid and its conjugate base for the reverse reaction. Now, when looking at the reverse reaction, that is from the product side to the reactant side, you have NH4 plus plus OH minus. Now, in this reaction, when we go the reverse direction, NH4 is giving away a hydrogen ion because we started with NH4 plus but we ended up with NH3 meaning we've subtracted from 4 to 3 we've subtracted a hydrogen ion so meaning in this reaction the NH4 plus is giving away a proton meaning we can say the NH4 plus in this reaction becomes an acid and the OH minus becomes the base. Now, if NH4 plus is the acid, then NH3 will become a conjugate, a conjugate base. Uh, this is getting too messy. Let us quickly do this. All right, so we are saying, guys, here that looking at the reverse reaction, you have NH4, which gave away a proton to OH minus. Then, when NH4 gave away a proton, it became NH3. So, if NH4 gives away a proton, NH4 plus, the, which is the ammonium ion, becomes a proton donor, meaning it is an acid, according to Lowry and Brausted. Now, since it has given away a, a hydrogen ion, a proton, NH3 then becomes a conjugate, a conjugate base of this acid called the ammonium, the ammonium ion. That is when looking at the reverse reaction. Now, if we were to look for the forward reaction where NH3 reacts with water at equilibrium with NH4 plus in aqueous plus OH minus. If the question had said identify the acid and its conjugate base for the forward reaction, in this case our NH3 will be our base because it would have gained a proton from the water molecule then the water, because it gives a proton to NH3, water will therefore act as an acid. Now, when NH3 has gained a proton, it, NH4 then will become a conjugate a conjugate, a conjugate acid. So NH4 plus will become a conjugate acid of the base NH3, looking at the forward reaction. But looking at the reverse reaction, the ammonium ion, which is the NH4 plus, will become an acid, and NH3 will become a conjugate, will become, yes, NH3 will become a conjugate base of NH4 plus. Now, guys, I think we've done enough so far. Let's take just a break and we will come back and do more questions on acids and bases. Let's go to, uh, I think we are done with this one. Yes, it was 1.2. Let's go to our next question. All right. 
So here, ammonia is very soluble in water. This gas is bubbled through 500 centimeter cubed of water to form a solution of ammonium hydroxide. Okay? The equation below represents the chemical reaction taking place. So we have ammonia again as a gas reacting with water liquid to give us NH4 aqueous and OH or the hydroxide ion in aqueous. Then we are told that the diagram below represents the micro view of a sample of the molecules in the beacon. Now note, this molecules which are in this beaker, they represent the following chemical reaction, which is then reversible. Now, the question now says to us, use the diagram to determine if ammonia is a strong base or a weak base. Now, guys, this is very important. Is ammonia a strong base or a weak base? Can you give me the answer? Yes, yes. Ammonia is a weak base. But then, what, what determines, how do we know if ammonia is a weak base? What determines its strength? What, what is the common characteristic that one needs to look at when he or she has to identify whether a particular substance is a strong or a weak base? Now, You will remember that we defined a strong base as a substance that ionizes completely in water. That is a strong base. And a weak base as a substance or a compound or a molecule that ionizes only partially in water. Now, for example, let's look at the acid. Say we have HCl. In water. Now, what we are saying here is, when HCl reacts with water, you will get. Oh, sorry. When HCl reacts with water, it will donate a proton because it is an a Bronsted Lowry acid. It will uh, donate a proton to water in aqueous, and then give us. Uh, a CL, a CL minus. Now, when we say a strong acid ionizes completely, take a look at the arrow here. I did not do a reversible reaction. I, you will remember that the double arrow will symbolize or will mean that the, the rate of the forward is equal to the rate of the reverse, meaning the, the reaction is, in essence, reversible. But look at what I'm doing for a strong asset. I'm just simply giving you one arrow to the right. This is saying to you that your reaction shifts to the right. The HCl completely reacts with water to produce the hydronium ion and the Cl, the Cl minus ion. So after the reaction has happened, it actually means there's nothing left of the HCl. All the HCl we had was converted into H3O plus plus Cl minus. Hence, this single arrow to, to the right. The reaction shifts to the right completely. It does not come back. So that is a characteristic of an acid. It completely ionizes in, in water. You completely get a full product. But contrary to, uh, to a weak acid, a weak acid will ionize partially in water. What does that mean? The equilibrium will not shift directly to the, to the right. So though you will be forming a product, but at the same time, you will have your products forming back the reactants. Yes, yes, I hear some of you saying, we learned that at chemical equilibrium. Yes, that's exactly the same principle. So when we say something is a weak acid, we are simply saying it does not ionize completely. It does not form everything 
uh, from its reactant. So some of the reactants, yes, are used to produce the product, but not all of it. So in a reaction, you will still find some of the reactants in the system while the products are still being formed. I hope that makes sense. Now, getting back to the question then, I think it will be easy now to answer the question having uh, gone through that preview. Now, the question is using the diagram to de use the diagram to determine if ammonia is a strong or weak base. Now, let us study this diagram. Now, here you have this molecule. I think, I believe that this should be hydrogens. And this, sh this should be a nitrate. So you have NH3. You have NH3 in your, in your container, in your beaker. And then I believe that the yellow circles will have to represent then water. H H2O. Now, let us observe exactly what is happening. So you have molecules of water. You have molecules of water. React, let's, let's count them. Uh, it's one, uh, it's, it's two, it's three, it's four, it's five, it's six. So you have six molecules of water reacting with how many? You have one molecule of ammonia, two, you have three, you have four. Yes, you have, you have four. So it's f four molecules, pink, and four, five molecules of water, which is, which is green. Now, let us look what is happening. As the reaction proceeds, what we observe is the NH3 here has gained a proton because now you have H. Oh, let us be consistent with the colors so that you do not get confused. Uh, yes. So you have H, you have H, you have H, and you have H. So meaning this is the ammonium mo ammonium ion. This is the NH4, the NH4 plus. And then when you look at it again, here you have the, remember this is H2O, but it has lost one hydrogen atom. Then this becomes your, your OH minus ion, your hydroxide ion. Now, we are asked to determine whether it's a strong base or a weak base. Now, remember, on the theory that I've just given to you. We said, for it to be a strong base, it must ionize completely, meaning all the NH3 must react to give us the NH4 plus ions and the OH minus ions. So we must have a greater concentration, greater number of particles of NH4 plus and OH minus ion for us to conclude that it, it is a strong base. Now, looking at what is happening, you had five... Uh, that is for, for ammonia with the pink, you had one, two, three, four. Yes, it's one, two, three, four. You had four molecules of ammonia, which are then producing uh, only one molecule of NH4. Now, what is this saying to us? This is saying to us that ammonia should be a weak base. Why? because it is not ionizing completely. We are not getting a greater number of NH4 plus ions as the product. So we are not dissociating completely because we still have uh, a greater number of ammonia ions, not ions, of ammonia molecule on the reactant side, but we have a lesser amount of ammonium ions on the product side. Now this means that ammonia did not ionize completely. So the answer to the question will therefore be, is ammonia a strong, no, ammonia is a 
a weak a weak base reason being yes ionizes partially it ionizes partially in in water are we clear guys yes let's move to the next question then Now, 1.4, predict the pH of the solution. Now, you would remember that the pH scale ranges from 1 to, to 14, where 7 will be neutral, then anything less than 7 will be acidic, anything greater than 7 will be, will be basic. Now, we are asked to explain, or to predict rather, we are asked to predict the pH of our, of our solution. Now, let us look at what is, what is happening here. As the reaction happens, you are producing the NH4 plus ions and the OH minus ions. Now, the OH minus ion will be the ion that will represent the basicity of the solution. Then, as we go down, remember that the pH is equal to minus log of the concentration of the H of the H plus. And the POH is equal to minus log the concentration of the OH minus ion. Now, if you have that reaction where NH3 is reacting with water and it produces the ammonium ion, which is the NH4 plus ion, plus the OH, the hydroxide ion. So it means that our solution then has a higher number or a higher number of particles of OH minus ions, which will then tend to make the solution a little bit more basic. But had we had uh, maybe the H plus ions, that would have resulted, or the H3O plus, the hydronium ions in our solution, that would have resulted in our solution becoming at least more acidic. So because we have the presence of the hydroxide ions in the solution, then we can predict that the pH of the solution should be at least basic. So the answer then to this question that says predict the pH of the solution, we are saying because of the formation of the hydroxide ions in the solution, we therefore predict that the pH of the solution will be basic. Now 1.5, explain how you could prepare a more concentrated solution of ammonium hydroxide using the same amount of same amount of ammonium gas, ammonia gas. So uh, the concept, we need to prepare a more concentrated solution of ammonium hydroxide using the same amount of ammonia gas. Now, remember, guys, by definition, concentration, it is the number of moles per unit volume. And you remember that the number of moles will refer to the number of particles. That is what you learned in grade, grade 11, the definition of, of a mole. So when we remember the equation to calculate concentration, that is C is equal to N over V. This equation is simply saying to us, as the number of particles increases, the concentration of a solution will increase. But if the volume increases, then the concentration of the solution will decrease, meaning CV are inversely proportional. So for me to, in, 
how explain how you could prepare a more concentrated, a more concentrated meaning I need to increase my concentration. Now looking at the formula and the variables I'm dealing with, they are saying to me, using the same amount of ammonia, ammonia gas. Now looking into this, into this question. When we started, they said to us, ammonia is very soluble in water. This gas is bubbled through 500 centimeter cubed of water to form a solution of ammonium hydroxide. I think that's why we highlighted that the volume was 500. Now, me and you agree now that for me to increase the concentration, because the issue here is the volume of water, which is 500, because we are using the same amount of ammonia gas, meaning we are keeping the number of particles the same. We do not change the number of particles and remains constant. Then the relationship is between C and V. V must go up. If V goes up, C will decrease. But if V comes down, C will increase. Now, I suggest that when we answer this question, let's say for us to prepare a concentrated ammonia ammonium hydroxide, let us rather, instead of using 500 centimeter cubed of water, let us use anything less than 500, say 300 centimeter cubed of water. Now guys, when using 300 centimeter cubed of water, rather than a 500, we are actually decreasing the volume, and when decreasing the volume, remember the number of moles, uh, we said same amount of ammonia gas, meaning the number of moles remain constant. They do not change. So by changing the volume, we would have successfully increased the concentration of the substance. Now, remember what was the question. Explain how you could prepare a more concentrated. So we want to increase the concentration. We do so by decreasing the volume from 500 to 300. And when we decrease the volume, we increase the concentration of the ammonium hydroxide uh, solution. Now, guys, I think we've done enough so far. Let's take just a break, and we will come back and do more questions on acids and bases. Welcome back, guys. Now that we've uh, touched on all, almost all the questions that we're dealing with theory, now on the second part of it, I would like us to deal with questions now that deals with uh, calculations. Now, I have a question lined up for you here. Let's quickly look at it. So this is uh, adapted from the DBE. It was paper two high grade. That was back in 2004. Now, we have a sodium carbonate crystals, that is sodium carbonate hexahydrate. I mean, it's uh, sodium carbonate is deca, it's, it's 10, 10 H2O decahydrate. It's used to neutralize hydrochloric acid concent with concentration of 0 0.1 mol per decimeter cubed. So we have the concentration of the acid, it is known. Now the first question says, write down the balanced chemical balanced chemical equation for the neutralization reaction. Now, if we can quickly do that, we have Na2CO3 reacting with HCl, and this will give us sodium chloride plus carbon dioxide plus, plus water. Now, they said it must be balanced. So I have two sodium atoms. Then I think it will be good for me to say maybe two there. Then uh, this will leave me with two chloride ions. Then put a two there. And then, yes, CC, and then three oxygens, two plus one, two hydrogens, two, then I think my equation is, is balanced. 
So this will be our, our answer. So we have sodium carbonate reacting with uh, two moles of hydrochloric acid to produce two moles of sodium chloride plus carbon dioxide plus water. Now, going to the second question, we are asked to calculate the mass of sodium carbonate crystals that will be required to neutralize 200 centimeter cubed of the hydrochloric acid solution. So, just going up a little bit, we know the concentration is 0 0.2. 0 0.1 mole per decimeter cubed, but we are given sodium carbonate crystals. So we need to dissolve this, uh, we need to weigh in a laboratory sense, we need to weigh how much uh, of sodium carbonate in terms of grams will have to be dissolved in 200 so that we can neutralize this 0 0.1 mole per decimeter cubed of HC, HCl. Now, the way I would like to go about it, the question is asking me to calculate the mass. And one equation that one can think of is that we know that, okay, number of moles is mass over molar mass. If I were to make mass the subject of the formula, then this mass is equals to number of moles multiplied by the molar mass. Now, at this stage, I don't have the number of moles of sodium carbonate, and I don't know the molar mass. So the right thing to do will be, let's try to find uh, the molar mass of sodium carbonate. And then you did this in grade 11, and you will remember that the molar mass of sodium carbonate will be 2Na, because I have two uh, molecules of Na, added to C, added to three oxygen atoms. Then you would remember that you have two, and the molar mass of sodium is 23, plus the molar mass of carbon is 12, plus three, and then you would remember that the oxygen is three, uh, the molar mass of oxygen is, six, is 16. Now, so you have, a, let's quickly do it. You have 2 into 23, add it to 12, plus 3 into 16. And, and this equals to 106, and this will be grams per, per mole. All right, so I found my molar mass of the sodium carbonate. Then one thing I will need to find again are the number of moles of the sodium carbonate. Now, the question is, how do we get the number of moles of sodium carbonate? Now, what do we know? What are we given? We are told that the volume, we are told that the volume of hydrochloric acid is 200 centimeter cubed. And remember, we were given the concentration. The concentration was 0 0.1 mole per decimeter cubed of hydrochloric acid, right? Now, knowing those two values, my mind then says to me, I can then be able to find the number of moles of hydrochloric acid because I know the concentration of hydrochloric acid. I'm given the volume of the hydrochloric acid. So meaning, you substituting, I will get N is equal to CV. And I know C, I know V. I can find the number of moles of HCl. Let's quickly do it. So the number of moles Let's use, let's be consistent maybe with the color. The number of moles of HCl is equal to the concentration of HCl multiplied by the volume of HCl. I was told that the concentration was 0 0.1. This was mole 
a dm cubed. Now remember, you are given uh, the volume in centimeter cubed, and you want to find the number of moles, meaning we're going to have to convert the centimeter cubed to decimeter, to decimeter cubed. And then you would remember that we will just divide by 1,000. We will say 200 divided by 1,000. Then this will give us 0, 0,2. Then the 0, 0,2 will be in decimeter, in decimeter cubed. Now, the decimeter cubed will cancel the decimeter cubed, and therefore, you will be left with number of moles of HCl is equal to then A 0 0.1 multiplied by a 0 0.2, which will give us a 0 0,02 moles. All right. Now, th this is not what I'm looking for. Remember, I was asked to find the mass of sodium carbonate. But at this stage, I've calculated the molar mass of sodium uh, carbonate, but I just need to find the number of moles of sodium carbonate. So how do I use the number of moles of HCl that I've calculated to find the number of moles of sodium carbonate that reacted? Now, going back to the reaction, I, still, I think you will remember now, going back to the stoichiometry that you learned in grade 11. You have one mole of sodium carbonate reacting with two moles of HCl. But remember, uh, going down, all right, so let's clear our page, all right. Let me use a different color for now. You have uh, two mole. of HCl reacting with one mole of your sodium carbonate. But these two moles, you're using 0, 0,02 during the reaction. You are using 0, 0,02 moles of, uh, of hydrochloric acid. But we want to know. As we are using 0 0,02 mole of hydrochloric acid, how much will we need then, how, much, how many number of moles will we need of sodium carbonate to react with 0 0,02 mole of HCl for neutralization? Now, guys, let's, let's be realistic about this. If one mole reacts with two, and two mole of this is 0, 0,02. Half of two is one. So this means if I have 0, 0,02 of HCl moles, sodium carbonate will need to use half of the moles which were used by HCl for neutralization. Remember, this is stoichiometry. So if the ratio is small ratio, if the ratio is one is to two, one mole of sodium carbonate reacts with two moles of HCl. I have 0, 0,02 mole of HCl. I need to know how many moles of sodium carbonate will I need to react with this 0, 0,02. It will be half of that. So, we're saying now, using stoichiometry, number of moles of uh, the number of moles, okay, we, we're looking for, uh, yep. so we're looking for the number of moles of sodium carbonate, Na2CO3. We're saying it will be a half of that, meaning because of the ratio which is one is to, is to two then this will therefore be 0, 
comma zero two divided by two zero comma zero one mole. So these are the number of moles of sodium carbonate I will need to react with with HCl. Now I think my problem is solved. Remember, the equation we were using said m, small letter m, which is the mass, is equal to the number of moles multiplied by the molar mass. The first uh, part of it, we tried to find the molar mass of sodium carbonate, which we found to be 106 grams per mole. Then the second part of it, we wanted to find the number of moles of sodium carbonate that is needed to react with the 0 0.02 mole of HCl, and we found them to be 0 0.01. Now then, if that is the case, we can then answer the question by saying the mass needed uh, of sodium carbonate to react with the HCl is N times molar mass, where N is 0, 0,01, where the molar mass, you remember, we calculated it to be a 106. Here's it. We calculated it to be 106 grams per, per mole. We have found our number of moles that are, re are going to react with the 0, 0,02 moles of HCl. It's 0, 0,01 then we are multiplying it by the molar mass of sodium carbonate, which is 1,06. Now let us use our calculator to find that. So we have a 0, 0,01 multiplied by 106. And then our answer is 1,06 grams. So we need 1,06 grams of that needs to be weighed of sodium carbonate crystals to come and react with the, uh, the volume of, remember the volume was 200, 200 centimeter cubed of HCl to, to, to get complete neutrali neutralization. Now, let's move to the second question, guys. Now, this was adapted. Again, it's a national senior certificate on 2004. So we have sodium carbonate crystals again, which is used to neutralize uh, hydrochloric acid of concentration 0 0.1. It's the same as the question we've just did now. The table below gives information about some common laboratory indicators. So we have a methyl red with a pH that ranges from 4.8 to 6.0, so meaning methyl rate will probably be used for s solutions which are a little bit acidic. Then we have neutral rate with a pH of just below 7 at 6.8 and moving towards uh, the basic side, which is 8.0. And then we have chlorophenol rate from exactly 7 and then becoming basic until 8.8. So which indicator will you choose for this reaction? Remember now, guys, we are reacting sodium carbonate with HCl. And as products, we got sodium chloride plus carbon dioxide plus water. Now, this is a typical hydrolysis question. Now, remember, during hydrolysis, that's when basically a salt reacts with water. But don't confuse it here. Say, for an example, you had maybe hydrochloric acid reacting with sodium hydroxide. Both are strong acid. You will get sodium chloride as, uh, as a salt. But the pH of that solution, obviously, it's a strong base and a strong acid. It will be neutral. The pH of the salt will be, will be neutral. But in this situation, you have sodium carbonate, which then neutralizes the HCl, the hydrochloric acid, to give you sodium chloride. But we cannot say that it is neutral. Don't confuse it with the acid-base reaction where HCl and sodium hydroxide are reacting. But here you have three products. You have sodium chloride, you have carbon dioxide, and again, you have water. So in this situation, you will find that your carbon dioxide will react with water to produce the carbonic acid. 
Now, with the carbonic acid being produced, meaning my pH should be somewhere uh, below, below 7. So a suitable indicator to use in this case will be a methyl, a methyl red. Which indicator will you choose for this reaction? Methyl red. Explain your answer. Remember what I've just said. I said you have three products that you are forming here. You have your sodium chloride, of which you would expect that it should be neutral. But it is only neutral when it is coming from a strong base and a strong acid. But in this case, you have sodium chloride, you have carbon dioxide, and again water. In this case, the water reacts with the carbon dioxide to produce carbonic acid, which will then tend to make your solution, your solution a little bit acidic. Hence, now, the cho the, we choose this indicator, methyl rate, that ranges from a pH of 4.8 to 6.0, indicating that the solution will be acidic. I hope you got that, guys. Hello, oh, guys. Unfortunately, we've run out of time. But like I've been doing, please remember, just know what is being asked. Know what are you supposed to calculate to get what is being asked. If you can develop the skill, you won't have a problem when it comes to solving acids and base problems. From me to you, until we meet again, guys, bye-bye.